it's, it's more, it's, it was actually established to, to meet the needs of families yeah. and uh, yeah. the The school board meeting of Tuesday, August 20th is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda, but before we do that, I'd like to introduce our interim superintendent, Dr. Cynthia Moles. We are glad to have her with us for the year. Thank you. Uh, we have two additions tonight. One is in the area of committee reports, and we'll have reports on the pool committee, the building committee, and the technology committee. And we also have one coaching nomination under new business. I don't see Sue Weatherby, so there may not be a building committee report if she does not come. She doesn't come. Thanks. Um, the next item on the agenda. Clarification oh, on the technology term. committee. We were just going to introduce Announce. that Jay oh. is working in on board. Because they have not met as a committee. No, that's fine. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is approval of school board minutes. We have a June 10th organizational meeting, a June 11th school board meeting, a July 12th special school board meeting, and an August 9th special school board meeting. I have one change on the organizational meeting under five, which is on page 36B. I think it was, I asked for discussion of summer meetings and dates. It would be Beth Courier instead of the superintendent. And then on page 38A, under 6C, it is Ann Chapman, not Ann Courier. <laughs> that one. And does anybody else have some? Under 9A on page 38C, I didn't remember a brief discussion, including the assurance that Dr. Moles will resign if a full-time superintendent is found. Where, where is this? On page 38C. No, I don't recall. I don't that. think so. We did have that discussion at some point, but I and I thought we decided exactly the opposite that it wasn't in the meeting. No. Um, so I just, I didn't want the minutes to reflect, um, reflect that. Um, were there any others? Seeing none, the minutes stand approved. The next item on the agenda is communications. Um, on behalf of the board, I wanted to express um, the sympathy and our thoughts of being with the family of Brandon Halfacre at this difficult time. Are there any other communications? Seeing none, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Cynthia. First thing we have is the school volunteer services annual report, and you have information in your packet, and Gail is here to perhaps make a few comments. I'm, I'm not quite sure where you're writing the this from. <laughs> yeah, right over there. Oh, right here. <laughs> <laughs> Can I share space with you? Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, you can imagine I'm not quite here by free will, but I'm happily here. <laughs> um, yes. The mic is on that stand right there. Speaking to sure. that one. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Yeah. All right. 
That's just fine. Perfect. Um, I think you all have a copy of the report. And what I wanted to, what I thought I'd like to do is to just highlight a few pieces of the report and then field questions and comments. Does that seem Sounds like great. logical? Yep. A logical thing to do. Okay. Um, first of all, the good news is the program has expanded and matured and since its inception about four years ago. The bad news is that because of its expansion, the demands of managing the program have increased. So we're nearly at a lock grid or gridlock position. Um, I experienced a gridlock on a turnpike this summer one day and <laughs> experienced a frustration. And in order for us to expand very much more, the programs that expand will need more management to be quality programs. So it's with that that I would like to put on the table as a seed to begin to think about is to expand the time allotted for the director of the program. Um, I understand budgets are tight. Um, I just really feel in good faith to the program and to the students that we serve that I really need to put that onto the table. Usually, Gail, it would come forward through the budget process and it uh -huh. would be great to have that, you know, as the okay. budget is put together to propose that and, you know, any okay. backup information and things, which is just like your report here. Fine. Um, and I didn't, I assume you weren't expecting it for this fiscal year that it would... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And my, my um, purpose for bringing it tonight is to just plant the seeds in each person's <laughs> little being there um, so that we can begin to think about it, where we want to go. Okay. Um, if you can follow along in your report, I think that's the most logical way for me to do it. Um, first of all, we did, under registration, we did register a lot of volunteers. Is now a form that has a confidentiality statement on it. And my goal is to have all volunteers in the school system sign a confidentiality statement and understand what it means. Um, we initiated it, I would say about a third of the volunteers have done that. Secondly, we passed out um, volunteer guidelines to every student and their family this fall, last fall. Um, I feel good in that it puts on the table exactly what the guidelines are, so that there's not too many questions, or at least there's something to question from. This year, they'll go out just to new students. Um, <clears throat> number three, I think is, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, we had a total of 505 volunteers, 210 of those recorded their hours. And I'm, I want to say a 505 reflects um, volunteers identified by staff members as making a significant contribution. It doesn't in any way reflect the total number of volunteers we have in the system. It reflects those staff members that identified volunteers to receive a thank you and a seed packet. So I'm absolutely positive that this figure is much larger than 505. I don't attempt to include one-time field trip chaperones or, quote, brownie bakers. Um, but we at least know we have 505 people making significant contributions. I think that's pretty good. Um, 210 of those recorded their hours. The number of hours recorded were 8,057. And if we were judging a dollar value on the minimum wage at 425, the um, dollar value of a volunteer service over the year would be $30,000, $30,372. I'm a little nervous. I'll get over it. Um, if we chose to use the figure that the National Points of Light system um, uses, the United Way uses that, many national organizations use that, our dollar value would be $98,127 that it, these volunteers give to the school. I would like to add that that's a tiny, tiny piece of the salary you pay for a volunteer director. Keep <laughs> <laughs> uh, it on the table. Um, also, in the Pond Cove number of 359, 18 of those were fathers. And I think that's pretty noteworthy that we're starting to see a shift. Um, Also, under students, the total students that volunteered in the schools were 23 from the student service program at the high school. That does not include the students that went to other arenas to do volunteer work. That only counts the volunteers that came to the schools. 
and we had 15 big buddies. Um, so, moving along to number four. Uh, volunteers responding directly to the Director of School Volunteer Services. I gave you an overview of the four years that we've been tracking, and this year it's doubled. The figure was 94 parents that came through me and were placed by me, responded to ads by staff members that I processed, and last year it was 44. So that's a good 50% increase. And thankfully I have a telephone at my service because it rings a whole lot. And Monday mornings after the courier comes out, I like Christmas <laughs> because the phone is ringing. And I think that's good news. The staff requests that were met this year were 98%. Actually, it's probably 99%. There was one request all year that was never met that staff made, and that was for a junior great books helper at the Pond Cove program, and that required specific training. So I'm not too surprised that didn't surface. But nevertheless, we kept asking. So all the other requests that were made were met. Um, a couple of highlights of these placements, in addition to the multitude of placements in classroom and media center and library, were um, a program on living history in the sixth grade. We had a participant from Woodstock, a member of the US Navy at the Korean conflict, and a survivor of the Great Depression. And it turned out to be very positive. It was kind of fun to track those people down. Another highlight were, the, were several Cape Elizabeth High School recent graduates that um, stepped up at the end of the year to lead drama rehearsals for the middle school gifted program. And that was, it was a much needed piece and they came very happily and filled the gap. Several high school students stepped up to meet a need of, a, of some first grade teachers out on the playground to teach hopscotch, marble games, um, and whatever other games the kids were interested in. And that worked real well. Another one that is going to happen again this year is Key Bank, right here over on the corner, closed its office for an afternoon to do community service. And we had five Key Bank employees doing various things in the three schools, including community services. Well, actually, it was extended daycare. Um, they're coming September 12th. And I make this announcement or information to all the principals that they're coming September 12th. I said, yes, we'd love to have them because I would. And let me know if you have something that you would like to have them do. They'll be here on Thursday afternoon from 1 to 4. And I welcome them with open arms. It's really wonderful. They were very helpful last year. Um, also, there were many tangible items that were solicited this year. It was a very effective way of getting some equipment for Example, used telephones for the lang foreign language program. We now have quite an assortment of used telephones. In fact, we've said we don't need any more. We've got so many. And it works very nicely for conversations in Spanish and French. Cooking utensils and supplies for the special services class at the high school. Uh, various pieces of equipment for the middle school science program. And it was always a surprise as to what we were going to get. Um, we, we got, I think it was, Nancy, a barometer that was actually worth about $300. Um, another person donated extensive beakers and, and chemistry equipment that their son used, and the son is all grown up. So we got the benefit of all that. Um, I see that piece as growing, that we just put the needs out there and people come forward. Number five. Um, there's now a database for the volunteers, thanks to the in-service ClarisWorks course. Um, I'm now computer literate as far as database goes, and that's real helpful in my position. And it's very valuable. Um, somebody asked me if for, for a woman's history speaker, I could punch that into the database, and I came up with a list of women's history speakers. So I was impressed. Oh, it works. <laughs> uh, number six. Awareness and update sessions were held, especially for Pond Cove volunteers. We had a few middle school and we had one high school volunteer that showed up. And I find it encouraging that the number increases yearly and it shows to me that the volunteers are taking their job seriously. In fact, 19 phone calls were made by people who couldn't make the session and felt responsible to get the information. So we're working on increasing that. Number seven, there was an awareness session held for Pond Coast staff about the student service program. Uh, Skip Crosby and myself presented that, 
it was one of the, um, I would say, one of the, the best discussions I've had with staff about volunteers. People were very honest, and Skip and I learned a lot about what the needs were, what worked, and what didn't work. So it was a worthwhile dialogue. And the most rewarding part of my job um, comes in sections 8 through 12, and that is when I get to work collaboratively with other staff and students on joint projects. Um, the first one is number 8, the student service program at the high school. Skip and I worked very closely and I think really got the program off to a very solid start. I think Rick would agree that it was, it was solid. And it was a lot of fun, too. Um, we had frequent contact, telephone contact, and we met bi-weekly. Um, and we're still working on parameters and guidelines, and those will evolve. I, I really trust they will. Um, number nine has also to do with the student service program. Uh, my job in the program was to solicit <coughs> opportunities at the Pond Cove and middle schools from the staff and to first of all say to the staff, trust me, it's, it's going to work, try it. And in fact, it did work. And I see that as nothing but growing. Um, I, we also got involved in planning the Youth Volunteer Day and we spent one Saturday afternoon. It happened to be an absolutely beautiful Saturday afternoon. Fifteen students and several of the staff members um, raking leaves, delivering, I think Rick was one, one of the delivery crews of soda and bagels to keep us all going. But we pretty much helped the elderly and the needy of the community. And I think that will definitely grow. Number 10 has to do with a second collaborative program is the middle school computer, it's, well actually the middle school advisor advisee program. And Hayden Atwood did a project on bringing Crescent House residents over to be taught the computer by his students. And it was quite an exciting program and I had the pleasure of leading a follow-up discussion with the students. It was a lot of fun and very rewarding. And the students learned a lot about this generation gap. Um, let's see, number 11 addresses the third collaborative project, which is, it was a, I, I really had a goal of having an encompassing project grades one through eight at least. And in fact, the opportunity presented itself, thanks to Gail Dransfield, of thank you notes for building us a new school to all the taxpayers. And I think it was embraced enthusiastically. The kids took it pretty seriously. And one of the exciting pieces was from the middle school foreign language students. Um, we had many letters in French and Spanish, and some of the students received replies. Mm -hmm. So it was an unexpected piece we really hadn't thought too much about. Number 12 speaks to the last collaborative project is the area of recognition. The highlight of the recognition this year for me was a Project Seed Adapter Grant that I received from the Maine Center for Educational Services to plan a recognition breakfast at Pond Cove. And my goal was to bring the school together to work on a joint project and to build a sense of camaraderie as the stress has kind of increased by the time you do placement and report cards. And it, was, it went far beyond my expectations as far as participation. Everybody participated. We had a lot of volunteers present. And it was a group of us that decided we would sing a song to our volunteers. So I don't think we're winning an Emmy this year, but perhaps next. Uh, moving on to number 13, one, another area I worked in was to support all three parents' associations and their volunteer efforts. Uh, worked with especially Pond Cove and Middle School, school to have one volunteer survey form that will come out in the fall on the first day of school. Parents were getting confused with too many forms. So we now have one. I think that's nothing but a plus. Uh, 14, let's see, the main alliance of partnering education. I was an active participant in that. And our program benefited, especially in the area of mentoring programs. Sarah Berman um, received, as an offshoot from materials I got, some invaluable pieces for the Big Buddy program. And she'll be anxious to share those with you, Rick. Some real good guidelines. Uh, the last one was to participate in the Blaine House Volunteer Workshop, which happened, and I spent the day with Michael Quigley, who was um, a protege of the Total Quality Management Program. Give me the name. Who's in charge of TQM? 
who wrote the book on TQM? Dr. Deming? Deming, that's it, <laughs> Deming. He was a protege at Deming's. Don't tell him I forgot. Uh, new areas that I was involved in or the program became involved in was kindergarten screening. Um, it turned out to be a very good screening. Um, I think the biggest piece that I did, there was a variety of pieces I did. The most satisfying piece was to allay the fears of the waiting parents. The kids were pretty much fine. Uh, many parents were, were, had worries where the kids are right. And I felt like an ambassador for the program, for the schools in general. Another area I began to work in was the initial, or the initial planning for the school business partnership component of the Equals MC Squared and participated in a half-day facilitated workshop. Real eye-opener. I got a lot from it. And I think that has a lot of potential. Uh, another new area was an invitation to be a guest lecturer at the University of New England, and it helped me to get an overview of where our program has come and what are the good components of it. So I think the program benefited a lot from that. And I believe that the place to train teachers to use volunteers is in teacher education, in the preparation. So that was rewarding for me. I think the goals on the next page are pretty self-explanatory. Um, the new areas of involvement really have to be as time allows because I feel a commitment first and foremost to the programs that are already running. So we'll just see. And the vol moving on to the volunteer data. It was kind of nice to have four years to put down there. There is a correction under volunteer data, the year 93-94, Pond Cove students, big buddy, did I go too fast? Mm -hmm. 35 instead of 15. It doesn't add up if it's just 15. It's 35. Um, I think probably you may have some questions about what's happening to these figures or why there are discrepancies, and I'll be happy to answer questions about that. I think at the middle school and the high school, high school especially, it is very difficult to identify a large amount of parents who volunteer for the school outside the school, such as boosters organizations, project graduation. I mean, there's a, a multitude of things that parents do. So I wouldn't be upset about the low number at the high school, because I think it's an identification issue. And I don't foresee us identifying them all. So, unless somebody has a miracle answer. And the next page are figures. Um, you can ask me questions about those if you want to. Um, I included the initial job description at the inception of this program, and it shows you from phase one to phase two where we've come from, and hopefully phase three will point us in a future direction as well. So I um, submit the report with your respects. And it's a wonderful report, mm -hmm. Neil. You've done a great job, and it's well, wonderful thanks. data you've collected. Are there questions from the board? And I yeah. have a couple. Um, sure. On these job descriptions um, for they, phase two and phase three, are these proposed by you for consideration, uh, or did this hmm. happen with? Connie or Connie and I came drew up phase one because we didn't know where to start from. Phase two has evolved, and I realized when I was doing the report that I'm really saying everything I do in my job, so let's just write it down in a list. So phase two is really everything I do in the job. Phase, and I talked it over with um, Cynthia. I met with Cynthia for a couple of hours, and we looked over the information. Um, and I'm very open to any changes in phase two or suggestions, deletions, additions. And phase three is where I would like to see the program continue to expand. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, okay. I, I do think we probably ought to have some kind of discussion at some point at the board level about what the role the role is. And uh -huh. one, one thing I was kind of wondering, um, 
about was what is what is your interface with the parents association now I know at one point there were kind of volunteer coordinators for each um, parents association right. and it seems now that you're doing the kindergarten screening I know that was a specific function um, of the parents association before so have you pretty much supplanted those kind of roles actually the parent association? I've I've augmented those roles in that those roles are still there and the Pond Cove volunteer coordinators did work on the kindergarten screening and did do the piece that they've always done. We realized that there were more pieces that needed to be done and so I took up the slack on the other pieces that needed to be done. So in fact those positions are still very active. In general those coordinators recruit volunteers for parents association projects. Right, okay. I think at, in terms of this discussion, it would be good to have the information about mm -hmm. what they're doing and what you're doing, just so we can kind of plug them into various job descriptions and see, just sure. see how they fit. Sure, thanks. So, look, say that, what, what would you like me to do? What here? their job, okay. you know, what the jobs are within the Parents' Association. What kind of projects they handle as opposed to what you do and just how that interface sure. works. Keith, did you uh, I was just curious about the, uh, the in-service programs for the teachers as to how they use the volunteers and so forth. Uh, are you, do you use programs that exist already? Or are you just helping them, helping them you to use the volunteers uh, in the classroom? I, I get the feeling sometimes that the teachers don't really know or are, are very good at using the volunteers uh, all the time in the classroom, uh -huh. certainly they, they do well. But, um, there's, uh, so could you repeat your question? Do you have some specific programs that, that are going to help the teachers teach them how to use the volunteers oh, in their classes? Oh, at the present, no. I, I would think that would be a good idea for a staff development day uh, sure. topic at some point. We've certainly had discussions about it. Mm -hmm. And the first meeting with the teachers at Pond Cove about the student service program was the you know, really the first piece that was done formally. It's done, in, I do it informally all day. I'm sure. In fact, most of my business is done in the corridor, but please don't put my desk in the corridor. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's really very much informal, and it's also done by role modeling, in that teachers who use them um, speak about their program, so other teachers, oh, let's tell me about that. Oh yeah, I could do that. So, no, I think that's that's a good idea to have okay. some kind of formal good, piece thank to you. it. Are there other questions or comments? Gail, I just wanted to um, re reiterate what Keith just said. I really feel like there's a need to um, spend time training teachers on how to use volunteers. And the examples I was going to use is I have been setting up math exploration programs for a number of years for uh, my own children's individual teachers. And I would be happy to talk to teachers or to parents on how to set those programs up. I also started all the theme projects when my daughter was in second grade. And I did go in one year afterwards to train the next group, but then was forgotten. Um, and those kind of things, I think, are really helpful if we can really Work. You were forgotten, or the program was forgotten? No, the program still goes on, uh -huh. but now people don't know who to call to figure out how to do it anymore, uh, okay. and, you know, all the forms and sheets and All right, then things. I'd love to talk to you individually then. Yeah, you know, but I really think we need to work with the teachers so that the volunteers in the classroom are really helping them to free up their time, you know, and correcting or whatever, so that they have more time with the kids. A nice challenge. Perhaps you can help give me some ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any other questions or comments? See none. Thank you very much, Gail. It's a very thorough Great. report, and we really appreciate it. And remember me at budget time. <laughs> we will. <laughs> I'm coming back. We will. <laughs> we will. Um, Cynthia, you're still superintendent's report. Right. One of the things that superintendents start to ask about the first of August and then every day thereafter is, are the schools going to be ready for the first day of school? And I've been asking Scott Poole in this, but since he's on vacation this week and Sue is here, we'll get Sue's feeling on... Uh... They should be ready. <laughs> <laughs> I want it a little bit stronger. is still here, uh, much to our dismay, but um, they most definitely will be ready. The hallways basically are the only things left to do, um, with the exception of some areas here in the high school. 
but uh, Con Cove and Middle School are complete with the exception of a couple of hallways. Um, the high school, the first floor, um, is just getting underway, and then the hallways need to be done, but um, those things go very quickly. So yes, most definitely, um, the schools will be ready. Thank you. Better than last year. Right. And the other item you have is the report on the national Spanish exam. Apparently, you earlier received a report on the middle school scores, and so this is just a continuation of that. So that's for your information. Unless Rick wants to make a further comment on it. No. Thank you. Um, then we're going to do school board subcommittees and report. Gail wanted to report on the pool study. Yes, we, ha we, we had a meeting yesterday. We had sent out an advertisement in the paper a while ago asking for um, RFPs for, from different companies to look at our Don Richards pool facility in the high school and received quite a number of uh, responses. We met with, the committee met, um, along with Mike McGovern and Sue Weatherby. And who am I forgetting? Just the regular committee. And we reviewed the, uh, the um, initial responses and chose three firms that we will be inviting to um, interview with us, hopefully early September. And then if everything goes according to plan, we will choose one of those firms to assess our facility and give us three options of improvement and renovations and address all the needs that we have um, and come with some plan before the end of this year. The pool will not be disturbed this year. Anything else? Thank you, Ben. Um, building committee. Sue, do you have anything to say on the building project? Projects are winding down. Um, the uh, inclement weather in July impacted much of the outdoor uh, work that needed to be done um, in regard to um, the work on the front of the 1930s building. Um, they're just now pouring the new stoops um, for some of the entryways, but um, they keep saying by the end of this week they're supposed to be out of here. And um, so that sort of remains to be seen. But um, they're making progress on lots of the punch list items that were incomplete or unacceptable. So, um, you know, hopefully by September 1, um, the Yale Poolin will be gone for good. And um, <laughs> well, the, the front of the 1930s building looks a lot better. It, it does. really looks nicer to drive, to drive through it. What were they doing to the middle school entrance? Um, when they poured the stoops um, to both Ponco and the middle school entrance, the slant was slightly towards the building instead of away from the building. Um, therefore, we, in heavy rainstorms or wind driving rain, we had puddles inside the door. So um, as part of the punch list, um, we did not accept those because they, they did not meet code and they had to actually tear them up and re-pour them. That was the only solution. Have we had a storm since we resurfaced the side of the gym with the clapboards? I was told last week that we had one and there was no leakage at all. And we specifically went to see it at the end of that storm. That was one of the. Any other questions for? Sarah? It actually looks very nice too. It does. Any other questions? Thank you, Sue. Um, technology committee. Um, do you want to just go? Well, ahead? technology committee hasn't met yet, but we do have Jay Trevaro, who's our oh. technology specialist on board, and he's been spending a lot of time this summer on all the ordering to be sure that the orders are in and ready for the first day of school and he's been very encouraged by the speed at which people have filled our orders and the other piece is the wiring he's been um, spending a lot of time with the wiring when you came in tonight i'm sure you saw all the wires hanging out of the the ceiling here he's concentrated on the high school first because a lot of the 
projects here could not be done when the students were in the building, whereas some of the projects in the other schools can be done later on. And he hopes to have this done before first day of school also. But he's on board, and we're very excited to have him. Charlie, Keith. I believe the technology committee is meeting next Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock. I think it's in the high school library. Great. Right here. Thanks. Um, next item on the agenda is unfinished business. We have a number of policies for a second reading. Gail? The policy committee has not had a meeting um, this summer, so these are policies for second reading that have been carried over from our June meeting. And the first policy tonight is the school sponsorship of social activities, JJB. Any discussion? Nope. I think we should probably just clarify what's going to happen with the administrative guidelines. Well, this is a policy that um, would cover extracurricular social events such as dances, proms, homecoming, and class outings. Um, and we are going to have administrative guidelines that will um, be attached to this that we will be working on this month. Um, and in this particular policy, uh, we state that this is a true partnership among school parents, sc students, and the community in order to maintain the health and safety of the participants. And that's pretty much what it states. I guess also to add, these events would have to meet certain criteria to be covered under the school's liability insurance, and those kind of criteria will be developed over the next month and would have to do with number of chaperones and the those kind of things. Discussion? Anybody? Is there a motion for that one? We thought we might take them separately. Charlie. Or the policy chair should. Go ahead. Oh. <coughs> so I move that we accept um, school sponsorship of social activities, JJB. Is there a second? Second. And any discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. And the second um, policy tonight, the second reading, is uh, the affirmative action policy. Um, AC. Cape Elizabeth schools are committed to a to an affirmative action program. Any discussion? We should probably just clarify in case people might have forgotten. This is just the first page of that long plan. Affirmative action plan. This is all we have to adopt as a policy, but I think George is still working on the particulars. The, the rest, yeah, of, the, the rest, the rest of, the of the policy. Yeah. Is there motion? Um, a motion? Yeah. Well, I guess I move we um, accept the affirmative action policy AC. Is there a second? Priscilla? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. The third policy today. Extracurricular and athletic programs, IGD. This is a word change from our um, original policy. Students must be passing all courses to be eligible to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities. This is a second reading. And, and you might want to state the previous reading was for the, courses they had. Yes, to. the previous uh, has been that all students must be passing four courses to be eligible to participate in an extracurricular and athletic. And I guess I'll start the discussion. Um, in June, uh, we had two different wordings that we were choosing between or voting between. One was this one where they must be, students must be um, passing all courses, and the other was that students would pass six courses. Um, and at that time, and I still believe that we should, um, Students must be passing six courses. And my rationale is that we have uh, increased the graduation requirements, that students would be taking six courses per semester. And in order to graduate from our high school, they need to be passing six quarters a semester. And I don't see why we have to put the hurdle any higher. I think we are already increasing our standards for our students. And that's my opinion. And I think another another level of concern here is um, whether or not this this also covers um, uh, middle school mm -hmm. students. Right now, it would cover middle school and high school, the way it is written right now. 
option two actually said um, high school students must be passed, so it was spe specified high, high school students with must the be six. passing six, yeah, so it did specify. The option with the six had to be high school because it didn't make sense for the middle school, um, which was the difference. But what we are looking at tonight is not that option. Correct. At the June board meeting, we did an indication from the board of where they felt they were most comfortable with which wording, the six courses or at the high school or the all courses. And um, a majority of the board was more comfortable with all courses. They may have changed their mind now or want to make changes, but that's why this wording came back specifically. This okay. Wording. I also went back and in between our little afternoon uh, workshop and pulled out several things. One was the, the increased graduation requirements. And starting in the fall of 96, all seniors will schedule a minimum of five courses. Um, if we went with high school students must be, must be passing six courses, the, the course, the graduation requirements and the extracurricular athletic program would not, would not be jiving. Mm -hmm. Good point. And the minimum courses for all others is six and no more than seven. Um, I'm happy to state my opinion. It is still as it was in June that I do think our primary goal is to educate students and that they must be passing their courses to participate in um, athletic and extracurricular activities. It's not to see them as a punishment, but to see them as what the priorities are and it fits with our mission statement. And I still feel the same. Anne? Yeah, I, I agree with um, I agree with Beth on this one. It, it just seems ludicrous to me that we can have kids in a position of not being able to pass their courses for some reason, yet have the time for the extensive practices and, and all that that goes along with athletics. And I think that's putting the, uh, the cart before the horse. Um, I think it is really not all that difficult for kids to um, pass courses here, and I think it might make kids think a little bit harder. It might make their parents think a little bit harder if there might actually be, um, you know, a, um, a downside to, to not trying to succeed. I just think we were asked all the time, um, you know, whether we don't just put a little bit too much emphasis on athletics um, to the detriment of academics, and I think this is a very clear way of saying um, we won't do that. What is a passing grade? Seventy. Which is a D. It's not a very high standard. Yeah, Rick, please. <coughs> First of all, when we had talked about to, to address your uh, concern about the, the credit status and that seniors would only be taking five, we also took that in consideration this year when we asked all students to take six courses. We did amend that to say that seniors for this year would only be required to take five. I think in terms of looking at eligibility, that would hold true and to say that for seniors it would be the five minimum rather than the four to up their ante, so to speak, as well as the underclassmen. Um, I think when you, when you look at this, please realize that a student may be failing a course for a quarter but in the ultimate end of the year, that student may pass that course. And if he or she starts a first quarter with a difficult course, and it may be the player playing soccer or, or field hockey, struggles a bit in that quarter, all of a sudden her or his el eligibility may be lost for the next, next semester. That student may end up with an, a, you know, an 85, 86 average at the end and pass the course. Um, so I, I, I just want to raise that, that it's, we're not talking about flunking a course for the year, but at one quarter of that time. And I hope it would not deter kids from taking a challenging course or increasing their challenge because of fear of, of possibly struggling with a course early on. Um, I recognize all of the things you say. I, I agree with what you're saying as far as uh, the emphasis being on academics. Um, but again, is it only the school's rule, role to say that you should be passing all of your subjects? There's not, nothing to say that parents can't intercede and say, if you want to play sports, you need to pass everything, rather than the school being dictating every, every piece of that. Uh, I think six ties in with the uh, the idea of that's what we're asking s students to take, um, and hopefully that would be a rigorous um, program for everyone. I think right now with so many students taking five subjects and flunking one or two, um, 
the, the issue is there, but I think uh, uh, I would su I, I would support upping the the uh, requirements. But I think I agree with uh, Gail as far as at this point anyway. We can start at six, and then if we feel the need to increase it, as I would love to see some numbers. I haven't been able to get numbers to compare how many students would have been eligible last year had they not passed one subject or, or had failed one subject, I should say, and to, and to have some data before making a judgment like this. I think it, it impacts a lot of kids, um, and it'll also cause, when we're looking at kids involved in co-curricular activities such as theater, speech and debate, and drama, how I hope there's equity when we look at this too, because the amount of events or competitions that a, an athlete may miss due to flunking one subject as opposed to missing two debate meets on a Saturday, I don't. I would have to look at that. So it, it won't be a, a balance, so to speak. We would try to work toward that. Again, just my, my, uh, my views in the end. Whatever you decide, uh, I will, I will uh, enforce and support. Thank you. Um, I, Rick, just to clarify, I thought you had mentioned to us, maybe it wasn't actually at the board meeting, but it was in the discussion about this, that you thought 42 kids would uh, but I thought when, we, when we looked at the number, I, I don't know if we were looking at if they had, um, if they only passed four. I, I have to go back. I wasn't sure if whether we looked at it, whether it was flunking one subject or passing six. We had looked at some numbers, and I would like to go back. It could be that, and but but I'm not sure what number we were looking at, whether whether if, if a student failed one subject or two subjects. Um, but I can certainly get that information just from from our records from from last year. I had Deb Raymond run that today, but uh, it was at the time of the meeting I, when I had re returned back, she had left. So, just I think a little more background, just in case people missed our first discussion. The old policy read four, which is the minimum required by the main principles. Right, Association. that's a state a state regulation, and many high schools vary from that. Um, some say five, some say all, and I think part of what our survey when we meet tomorrow night, I don't know. If of the questioning as far as eligibility came out of that but some I think I believe Portland High School a student has to pass every subject he or she is taking but I don't know if they have a minimum of courses that they have to take I'm not certain whether they can take five or plus four their graduation classes. requirements is less, less. Than, uh, less than ours right and um, we realized that with only four courses passed we would have students who wouldn't graduate from the high school because Correct. you would need to pass five Correct. or six courses now to graduate and um, it is also not unusual for student for schools to have a minimum grades required too to be eligible for we sports. Have, yeah, we have not. And we would at that. not have that. It would just be passing to be eligible. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of what you said about, you know, I don't see why it should just be the school to say it. Frankly, I think it would start putting the onus, you know, back on the kids and their families to be proactive, to keep up with your courses, to. If you're having trouble to seek the help in a timely manner, frankly, I think if we really looked at it in terms of the time and effort that is probably um, put into trying to help kids after they've flunked the course, um, I think, you know, of course it would be a transition in, you know, changing your thinking of I've got to take this seriously, I need to pass it if I want to do um, these other activities, but I think in the long run, um, it puts the responsibility right back where it belongs, and that is on the kids and their families to make sure they keep up the program with the program, that they take appropriate courses, that they're not just um, taking courses to fill space, which is right. not to anybody's benefit. Um, so I think rather than looking at it as punitive, I think it, it to me, it puts things in perspective but and uh, whatever. makes it a responsibility. Whichever way we go, six courses or all courses, we are doing that. We've, we've raised the expectation that children will be taking a greater number of courses and that they will be passing them. I have a problem with saying, of putting in a policy that it's acceptable to fail courses. I just don't think that should be you know, part of our mindset. How many students will be lobbying to take a seventh and an eighth course. I'm not, I, I don't have that number. You I think it'll eight, be a great number? You have to lobby to do eight, or do you have to lobby it, to lo do seven? Not for seven. An underclass uh, freshmen need to need to uh, apply to take a, take a seventh course, but sophomores, juniors, and seniors can take a seventh without that. Mm -hmm. And to take an eighth an eighth class, that, that needs to be appealed also to my office. Um, I don't have those numbers. Okay. I know we have an, a number of students taking seven courses, okay. upperclassmen. Uh, but I, I wish I had those uh, that data tonight. And, uh, again, we're putting together schedules right now. Two kids are coming in, and 
we're still doing some scheduling. Keith, I saw your hand. I just think that uh, in order to participate in the extracurricular programs and the athletic programs, that it's, uh, it's a privilege for the students. And for us to say that's okay to fail a class and, and, and still participate in those programs is, is, uh, doesn't make sense. And I think it's sending out the wrong message. I agree with Ann that, that uh, we should, it should be all. Well, then I have particular objection to including the middle school in this policy because I think the middle school philosophy is entirely different with sports than the high school. I mean, personally, that's how I feel. So I would, I would have to amend this somehow. I I also. Um, Go ahead. Uh, sorry. I also like to. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> just voice a concern. I think you know academics are number one priority. Um, but I think self-esteem is, is, is a very key priority. And I think that some of these um, pieces make up self-esteem. And um, I have a very high level of concern about um, creating a policy that, in my mind, um, is not going to accomplish much, but has the potential to create some damage, um, particularly if this um, extends to the middle school. I feel very uncomfortable about that. Um, my kids will be passing all, all <laughs> classes. <laughs> but that's me as a parent to say that. Um, I think that uh, I don't need a policy to regulate that for me. And, and I think that we're just, I think there's been a lot of confusion around this issue. Um, I think some of the wording um, has been a little misleading. Um, my sense is that, that this really requires some more discussion. Um, so? um, well, I feel very strongly on the high school level that this policy is appropriate. I feel equally strong on the middle school that I'm not sure that it is because I think that the, or at least I hope that the athletic goals in the middle school are looking at where they are developmentally and what it means to be on a team and all all those things that I think are are learning opportunities um, and I perceive that students who choose in the high school level to do an extracurricular activity or to join a team really are making a choice beyond what's important well not what's important but beyond the academics in the high school um, and so I, I would like to see this policy with it as it actually saying high school students must be passing all courses. Here. I, I get real confused when people are talking about acting like kids in this town don't ever have the opportunity and don't play sports until they get to middle school when all of a sudden in seventh grade they start playing. <laughs> This is, this is crazy. Everyone in this town is in community services programs, little league, soccer, you name it. These kids are in every program under the sun. It is not that they don't have enough opportunity. If anything, I think the school by, by middle school, I mean, we saw it, we're, we're, we're looking at this in the um, athletic study committee, kids are on many teams. If anything, I think families need a little help in getting their kids back focused on, you've got to have time to do your studying. When you're on one of these teams, you're at practice every day, and yes, it's valuable, but why wait till high school to send the message that your academics are important and you've got to get in line? You can do that in a nurturing, proactive way. It does not need to be punitive, but all through life, starting when you're tiny, you know, there's certain things you need to do to get to the to the next level, and I think it's awfully, awfully important not to um, not to send these mixed messages. Well, I would argue that I think we tend to, throughout, including children in daycare, which is my field of of I hear myself saying all the time to these five-year-olds, "Well, you're the big kids, and you can do this," and they're five years old, and they're still virtually babies, but we, we push them along and we move them along, and I think that this particular system um, is guilty of that in a lot of respects, and I don't think that middle school students are high school students, and I don't think that they necessarily are at that stage where they can make all those choices 
Um, I also think that we can say that I, we do have millions of sports out here, and you probably are correct that everybody's taken in sports and been on a team, but I don't think that those um, sports outside of the school system necessarily um, reflect um, what I would hope that the middle school is using athletics to teach. And I think that our expectations on what choices um, students make should be different for high school kids and middle school kids, that we should recognize the different levels of maturity. I, I think I'd almost step a, a step further and say that, you know, what we need to do is to sort of manage these issues more by principle, uh, more so than by policy. You know, the, the principle being what is right for this kid. And, you know, I will determine sort of what's right for my kid and, and someone else should, should determine what's right for their kid. Um, we're talking uh, extracurricular activities as well as sports here. And, you know, I, I think that we, we are forgetting about the whole person. And um, I, I think that's a big mistake. Uh, do you want to speak? <laughs> what would be the difference of managing a policy which says all students must be passing six courses versus all who must be passing all courses relative to extracurricular activities, co-curriculars. And what's the difference? I mean, how are you going to? Uh, you said there were there are some some management administrative. No, I guess what, problems. I, what I was trying to say is that regardless of the, of the policies, it is going to be difficult to as far as equity issues because it, it may seem that it, it it's. Uh, weighted more with athletics because kids are involved in more contests generally in sports than they are, say, in, in speech and debate and theater. So it may look like there's inequity there, but, you know, regardless of which, similar to right now with four, we still do that. But I just wanted, when we talk about this policy written as co-curricular and, and, and athletic, that, that you know that the co-curricular piece does not, imp it impacts kids, but probably not to the, to the extent of, of losing, you know, uh, the amount of time that, that an athlete would lose in a season, that's all. But, you know, as far as whether it's six or all, it, it uh, yeah. Sue, so did you want to say, or Charlie, do you have any other question? I would be interested to hear what the middle school principal has to say. <laughs> sure, either way, it doesn't matter. Sue, so, go ahead, and then Nancy can think for a sec. <laughs> um, I'd like to speak as a coach and a parent. Um, I think that, that it's wonderful that we have increased um, the academic requirements of the students and what we're trying to do is raise that level of academics. I also think that we don't want to make them so high that we discourage kids um, the right to fail. Um, as a parent, I had a, a, a child who wanted to take all level one classes, who wanted to take seven classes because he wanted to at least have the right to fail. I don't want to turn kids off by making that extra attempt to take that seventh subject or even a level that would prove to be difficult to them um, if they really couldn't meet those standards. So I applaud, certainly, you raising the level. But I think that if, if a child has to pass all courses, in some ways we may be discouraging them to reach for something that maybe isn't within their reach. And I'd, I'd hate to see us do that, too. Nancy? Such a fancy microphone. I feel like I was on the old Dave Garraway show or something. Um, but I, I think when I look at a policy like this, I like to think about under the old guidelines, what were we doing well and what wasn't happening. I I'm not aware of a situation where in the middle school we had a student who was failing that we weren't addressing with an action plan with the family, with the advisor, with all of the teachers. Always during those discussions, activities and involvements in sports and extracurricular activities is part of the discussion. And sometimes for those students, the very opportunity and the fact that they are on a team can serve as a tremendous motivator for doing better and for being more organized, for even talking about specifically with 12 and 13 and 14 year olds about how to use your time wisely before practice. 
If practice isn't until 4 o'clock, hey, you're here. You can sit in a classroom and work on your homework. So you're not leaving it until you go home. I think one of the things, and I know it's one of the things we'll be doing this year, is looking at the whole middle school philosophy and why we are a middle school and not a junior high. And one of the simple distinctions is, remember, junior high had its specific purpose was to get ready for high school. A middle school takes on the idea that we understand the uniqueness of emerging adolescence, which sometimes is being horrendously disorganized and not being focused and coming to an age where before everything fit in and I, it, I could make it all work and now suddenly it doesn't all work for me anymore. Is the best way to do that is to take something away. I agree with Anne, many of our students are involved in many types of sporting activities. We also have some students, they are few in number, but we have some students who are only involved in school activities. And for some of those students, they are our students who are most at risk. And if any way we can use extracurricular activities or sporting activities as a way to keep them actively involved in school, then I think we should take that opportunity. And our league, unlike the high school leagues, we do not have a guideline. We've talked about <clears throat> for eligibility. In our meetings, we have talked about and shared, do you have an eligibility requirement? To my knowledge, I think most of the schools do not. I remember specifically the one I interviewed for the Athletic Study Committee, which is Falmouth, does not have an eligibility requirement. Much of it has to do with our deep belief in the middle school philosophy. Now, if that's a philosophy we want to look at this year, let's look at that philosophy, and maybe this is part of it. But I really don't know of a middle school student who has continually played on one of our teams or continually been involved in an extracurricular activity who is failing subjects that we aren't addressing with some kind of an action plan. It, it works as a motivator for us. It helps focus them. And these are students who don't know how to be organized, quite honestly. That's one of our tasks. It's one of our challenges, it's one of our frustrations. But it's one of our tasks is to help get organized and to focus. And being involved in athletics and extracurricular activities for many of them is a motivating factor. And I just reiterate, I'd, I'd hate to have them lose that opportunity. I think it's absolutely our goal and intent that they be passing all subjects. We screen the report cards. Rick Madden screens all the seventh and eighth grade report cards at the end of each trimester and notifies the advisors and the teams who's failing subjects, who's got low marks. Maybe they're passing subjects, but they've got low marks in effort. So we can address those. That, that we need to still do. Maybe we need to do it more diligently than we have in the past. But I, I don't think that we've really abused the policy as it stands, to my knowledge anyway. Maybe we have it. I'm not aware of it. But um, I think it's worked for us. I think it's a goal to work towards. But I would just ask you to think middle school students, I do believe, are different than high school students. And it's not that they shouldn't be held to high standards, but we need to do that in a way that's constructive and building a strategy for success and involvement. We want them involved in our after school activities. Thank you, Nancy. Um, at this point, we've sort of all had a little bit of a say. If anyone would like to make a motion on a policy, we could proceed that way, or we could well, somebody needs to make a motion in some direction. Charlie? I would move that we accept the extracurricular and athletic programs with option two, that high school students must be passing six courses to be eligible to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities. Is there a second? Can I second? Yes, yeah, second. Is there a discussion? I'm just going to say I'm not going to vote for it because I want to. I would like to have them passing all, but um, but we can. Does anyone else want to? And that specifically says high school. High school specifically says high school. I want to give the middle school time to, if they're going to review what a middle school philosophy is. I want to give them time to. So you, um, okay. yeah, just just. To clarify then, you're just, you're kind of revising this policy from what we have in front of us for a second reading. That's right. And you're just applying it to high school students. Right. The board right. encourages students to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities provided that academic and behavioral guidelines established by the schools are met. 
High school students must be passing six courses to be eligible to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities. That is the policy that I am proposing. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor? Two. All those opposed? Three. Well, I'll oppose that. What? All those opposed? One, two, three, four. And George, are you abstaining? Mm -hmm. Do you want to state your reason for abstention? I can't abstain. <laughs> Um, I, I really, I really think that this is an issue that needs to be tabled, and 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 looked at, and we need to come back at this um, so that we uh, we all have a good sense, and it's not so confusing to everyone. Then you need to make a motion. Then you need to, to make a motion it, to table. To vote on but we need to vote yes. Okay. So you already voted. You have. Okay. It failed. Two. Yeah. Failed. Is there another motion <laughs> anyone would, would like to make? I would like to make a motion uh, that we that we take this uh, second reading of this extracurricular and athletic programs policy uh, and set it aside for further discussion, um, further amendments, uh, and and bring it back to uh, the board for a vote at a later date. Is there a second? For I that? second that. Second. Is there any discussion? Yes. Just in, in light of, of, of Nancy talking, um, I guess it, it does need to be separated out between the middle school and the high school. I don't think we, maybe we can't have a sweeping policy across the whole district. Um, so I would be, I'd be in favor of tabling it. All those in favor of tabling? One, two, three, four, five. All those opposed? Two. That carries five to two. Oh. Now, could we just clarify, what are we tabling it to do? What was I mean, the what are we going to do? What are we going to do now? We're, we're tabling it, but... I think... I, it, it would be referred like, back to the policy committee right. to, to we, review and come up with a different proposal. That you've had some, some guidelines of, that we need to separate out the middle school from the high school. It, it, just, one. it, seem, it seems to me that we are... We, we're probably pre prepared to deal with the high school issue. I don't think that we are. I, I think it needs to, as Charlie said, I think it needs to go back to the, the policy committee. Um, I think we need to solicit more input um, and, and, and get a good sense about what this issue is. I think it's very important, you know, when we start making policies that we understand what the implications are going to be. And this one, I think, has very broad implications, and I don't think that they're positive. I think we need to go back and, and, and do a, a, a better job at um, figuring out what is the objective of all of, of this. What, you know, what are we trying to accomplish um, by creating a policy, first off? We, we have, have, have a policy. policy. We have by, the policy. by changing the policy. We have the policy, which is outdated. And this was an attempt to update the policy. To, to update and as well, but it, it, it moved from covering not only the high school to the middle school. Correct. This one, one does. One of the options. Yes. Okay. That is so I think that we need to go back and revisit that. Um, it's, okay. been, it's been tabled. Is that it correct? has been tabled. Um, we will. That's the end of my policy. <laughs> That's the end of the policy. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is new business. And the first is a consideration of a resignation. Cynthia, do you want to? Or I will. Doesn't matter. You win. Um, we have a resignation from Wayne Dorr as our special ed director. He has um, taken another position. And it's not stated in the resignation letter, but um, Wayne, do you want to do you want to say what your new position is? Or no? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it doesn't matter. You can probably say it there. I'm, I'm uh, taking the position of superintendent of schools for Union 44. And we wish you well. Thank you. Thank you for all your years mm -hmm. here. And I've not been here very long, but I've been here long enough to know that he's going <laughs> he's to leave a busy. big void. <laughs> <laughs> he's been busy with me. Um, Thank you, Wayne, for all your years. We truly appreciate it. Um, is there a motion? Regretfully, accept Wayne Doyle's resignation. Is there a second? I'll second that. 
Uh, I'd also like to make oh, say a discussion. Go ahead, Charlie. People have heard me say this before, but I've been on the board for seven years, and Wayne has been here nine. And long ago, someone told me that the best way to to evaluate or judge the effectiveness of your special ed director is how many times you stay out of court. Uh-oh. In, <laughs> in nine years, we have only been in court once. And I think that's very good. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Um, all those in favor? 7-0. The next item on the agenda is a request for a boys' soccer preseason trip to Vermont. And this is just uh, for you to approve the trip so that the insurance covers. There are no, uh, no funds being requested. We had a long list of criteria we needed. Um, Anne, do you want yeah, to? Yeah, we, this comes up all the time, and I thought that we were now preventing this problem by having a very specific policy on this. Um, but we still don't have all the um, information we need on this trip. Um, and these summer trips are supposed to be, that proposal is supposed to be given to the athletic director before the end of school in June. And so I just feel, you know, once again, we have a, a summer trip with, without all the information and not given to us in a timely manner. The only comment I can make is that I know that Scott Poulin did review it in terms of the insurance and felt that it was appropriate. We're supposed to have dates, cost and fees, transportation, overnight accommodations, practice schedules, competitive schedules, names of students and chaperones, list of phone numbers, including emergency numbers. Well, I will say, um, since I have a child involved in this, that they have not chosen the 20 students that will be going on this trip. Well, okay, you know, so we are they, why are we, they waiting for the board's action, do you know? Or? No, they just started practice, and they wait until they see the teams, how the teams get made up, and they take the varsity team. Is this Isn't a new that, trip? No. No, it's been done. But never, when? never a board-sanctioned trip. If it has, the only trips that we have ever approved, and that was what actually prompted the policy that was written or the administrative guidelines, was girls' soccer. So this is the first time a trip has, for boys' soccer has come before the board. Except we season. did do a similar trip to this for the lacrosse season last spring. That it was, came before that us. It approved. came before us. Yep. And a baseball trip. So the, really the only thing that's missing is the chaperone, because there is no itinerary here. Mm, and where the they will be saying what the cost system. is, et cetera. What? Where they'll be staying? They could be staying with the teams that they're playing. Yeah, they stay in the family's I home. I called and asked for clarification on that, and they will be staying with team, members of the team that visit. That there is any. I'm sorry to be crabby about this, but is this that hard to follow so that we know, so that we don't hear, well, so-and-so said on the phone it's this, and can we get them in a timely manner? I can't believe that this trip is just being put together now for, what, next weekend? He, he gave that to the office the day before the last meeting. Right. 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 So we were actually given it in June? Well, the, the special meeting in July was, okay. as my memory serves me, it was given to the day before that. But it has been a month. I did get the spot. So this has gone before but not been a school sanctioned trip? Well, if That's they've true. gone before, it's never been. It's never come before this board. The only thing that we've ever seen as far as, as soccer has been girls. And because of the inappropriate at timeliness, et cetera, et cetera, it actually was canceled last year, the girls' right. trip. Except what do we do with the fact that the coach has given it to us in July, and we're just seeing it now in August, that that's not the coach's fault?
very difficult when we're put in these situations because it affects kids and the teams and things that are going. We do have a very clear guideline of information we need and when we need to get it. Um, and you don't know when no means no and we didn't get it in time. So yeah. Try to reach Andy Strong and have him up to speak to you before the end of the meeting. Right? Um, I don't we try to reach him down, down the street. Do you know if this went to uh, Keith Weatherby in June, which is what apparently what the guideline says? Do you know? Did it come through him to? <laughs> <laughs> when Andy brought it to the office, he told me he was bringing it because Keith told him. Oh, so all right, so that's. So he was apparently trying to follow the appropriate guidelines. Just it doesn't say that. Perhaps right. if I knew the guidelines better, I would have given it back to him and said you need to do this. Sorry. It's in the policy book, and the athletic director and assistant should know what the policy is. Um, I don't. So, so At are, this point, you're know? missing the names of students, which obviously is not a, they're yeah, not, available not available yet. And Ann, what is the other piece, the dollar amount? We don't have dollar amounts. We don't have the accommodations. We well, don't, that's have, what, that's we don't have the chaperones. Chaperones. Now, he may have felt that the dollar amount wasn't necessary since he wasn't asking for right. money, but that's... The boosters are paying for the transportation. They do have to pay for their food Friday evening and Saturday's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So there is a cost. To the participants. And again, we've had, we've we had issues with how is. kids are chosen for trips before, so we don't... If, if we get these things in a timely manner, we have time to ask to the ask questions. Them. Well, is there a motion? <laughs> well, well, first, I think if if this was given to Central us, office. Central Office in July, then in, and we're going to, um, if we're leaning towards a negative vote, then I think Andy Strout should be made aware of that tonight because I think he has tried to follow our procedure. Do you have a sense, Sue, as to whether he has his chaperones lined up? Is it just a case if it's not on the form or is this a work in progress? I don't know about the chaperones. I know that each of the coaches will be driving um, that community states, services that, yeah. bands and they will be sort of paying us um, for mileage in the bands. You as a there aren't any other people riding in the vans because I think they do plan to take 18 players and they only can take 10 in each van by law. So you, if there are chaperones, they're going separately, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Do you have a sense as a parent, Gail, whether they've solicited chaperones? No, I mean, I don't this know. was the first I heard about My son hasn't even heard about this yet, so. Um. But I do have to agree with Ann. We do have a policy. This is coming before us as a one of the coaches who is also the assistant athletic director. Therefore, that person should know what the guidelines are and shouldn't be, you know, should be following it to the letter as much as he can. And I would also agree with Gail. If this came to the central office before our last special meeting, it should have been brought to our attention then, and then these issues could have been raised. So, given given the. Uh, Kind of the, the situation here, and given the fact that it's been approved under the insurance, is that correct? Yes. Cynthia? Well, it, I think what he means is Scott has Scott checked has with insurance, it, and it would okay. meet the criteria. Uh, could we do a, a, some sort of provisional look at this, and 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 then and and put it to a vote, and then get the details that we need, with some uh, recognition that this would this would not be something that we'd entertain in the future. We, that's, I feel like unfortunately we've done that the so history of what we've done, that's why we made the policy and why I feel very frustrated because every summer we go through this um, with people just, you know, planning things and, um, you know, not, not following procedures. Um, I feel like that it did come to the office in July and so I w might be inclined to, to let it go, but it, it is very frustrating to not have procedures followed, especially by people who should know better. And um, it puts us in a very difficult position. 
I, and I am concerned about that chaperone issue because if there's no room for chaperones here, <coughs> I mean, I don't consider the coaches with all those kids adequate supervision. How many people in the van? So they can take nine passengers and one driver. Okay. And that's a, law, a state law in regard to transporting um, school for any school activity. You may only, even though you may have a fifth passenger van, you may only transport nine passengers and one driver. The stipulation is if you see that the person has to have a bus driver's license, you have to put a, and it has to be painted yellow. The lights. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So if you keep it 10 and under, then you, it is permissible to do that. And, you know, especially in a situation where we're just saying, well, they're staying with um, families. We don't know anything about the supervision in these <coughs> households or if they're going off to some big party or something. I, you know, I really but feel you, that But you're not going to, you're never going to know that in a, in a trip such as this where they stay with families, which is a fairly common situation. But there should be a list of... Oh, I have a list of the chaperones. Before, before this tri trip takes place, there should be a list of where the students are going to be staying, what families they're going to be staying with who the chaperones are, and that's the provisional aspect I would add, put to this motion. Otherwise, if that does not come forward before the trip is to take place on the 30th, the trip does not take place. It has to come to the central office, and the board chair has to be informed that everything is in place or the trip does not take place. Well, I would think it would have to be done this week. Yes. Well, the trip's next week. I know. That's what I mean. That's it should be done. The things but we're missing is the cost, approximately, although we know it's just the food and things, the kids' names that are going, chaperones, and, and list, list of, of families homes they're, be they're with, homes they will stay with. And I think you can't wait until they get there, the 30th, to know who they're staying with, because we are sponsoring this trip legally. I think the parents might want to know. I'm, sh I'm sure they know before they So I, that, I would propose approval of this trip contingent on those things being met. Otherwise, the trip doesn't take place. Is that and right? maybe that will send a message to the athletic director and the assistant athletic directors that there is a policy, administrative guidelines, and they need to be followed. Is, there a, is that a motion? That's my motion. Is there a second? I second that. George? Further discussion? All the, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, and we need to reiterate, summer, in the future, summer trips should really come to the board at their June, June. meeting. It says yes. that in the policy, doesn't it? Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Five. All those opposed? Two. It passes five, two. And, um, those would have to be met, and Cynthia, you and I Let can. You, know. you want to give this. you what is the deadline? You want to know this information, obviously before. Yes. Uh, what day is today? Tuesday. Today's the twentieth. I would say by Friday at the okay. latest. Okay. Next item on the agenda is a consideration of negotiation training request. And do you want to present that a little bit? Yeah. I was really hoping I could do this at the finance committee. So. <laughs> Um, I learned that uh, Harvard Law School and the project on uh, negotiation there, which is uh, Roger Fisher's um, group, um, teaches an intensive one-week um, course um, that is being given October 28th through November 1st um, this fall. Um, on you know an introduction to negotiation, and they you know you get to work with all the graduate students and work on cases and, you know, hear it from the guru himself. And I would dearly love to take this course. I think it would be valuable to the school system to have somebody um, have something more than just having read, read the book. We've all read the book and we're trying desperately to follow <laughs> those words of wisdom, but I think it would be valuable to have the opportunity to go and hear, um, you know, some practical ideas and get a chance to talk to you know, people who have a lot of experience in negotiations on, on how to deal with uh, various issues. And um, I would love to go. I would love it if uh, the school department would pay half of the cost. The total cost is $1,800. So I'm asking for $900, and I would obviously pick up the lodging and the food for that week and 
be delighted to share everything I learned with everybody when I get back in formal and informal ways. And I've participated in the program, and it's excellent. I recommend that you allow him to go. Are there yeah. any questions of Anne? Having done a one-day workshop on getting to yes, one day is not enough mm -hmm. to really hone some skills. And we don't, we as a board, don't do a lot of continuing ed and staff development. And I think knowing the types of negotiations that we have ahead of us and what we have faced in the past, I would strongly recommend that we pay half of her tuition costs. Great. I completely agree that we really, um, we put in a lot of time doing this job and any training we can get is, is helpful. Any other comments? I just had a question. Is is there a provision for um, continuing education for board members? No. Are there? There's a con in there the a central office. There's or? a conference under the superintendent's, yeah. like a discretionary fund. When we go to um, the fall uh, main school management um, seminar, um, usually our costs are absorbed in that. Um, any membership costs. Uh, we're also covered under a um, the school's insurance for when you travel, you're you're all, you're insured that kind of thing. So there are, but we are not paid for what we do and for the number of hours. And as long as I've been on this board, with the exception of coalition grants, which are grants, the board has never, you know, done anything of this mm -hmm. type. I think it would be a good idea if we started looking at some of these things, not to go off to San Diego or <laughs> Orlando in February or something, but um, there, there are a lot of things out there and then a lot of people with good information. It's just good to hear what, what people are thinking, so hopefully that would be valuable. I think you don't, you don't need a board action. I think it's just a consensus of the board. Is there a consensus? Yes. 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 Thank you. Good. Yeah. Enjoy, Anne. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I don't think, but we can't not be uh, The next <laughs> item is the board goals for 96-97. Uh, I think I might just read them quickly since they're short. Um, the goals for the school board for the 96-97 year is, are to prepare and present a budget for 97-98, which is both educationally and fiscally sound ratify all labor contracts with attention to a balance between the financial needs of the community and the personal needs of the staff, assess and complete the work of the district's committees on reading, health and guidance, arts, research, athletics and science, hire an outstanding superintendent to meet the district's needs, complete a short and long-term facilities management maintenance plan, assess the current teacher evaluation process against the teacher evaluation plan, develop guiding principles that foster an atmosphere of learning and respect throughout the school community, and work with the town to further the one town concept. And we met with the administrators earlier today, and um, I think we're well on our way to achieving some of them. Terry? Need a motion? That would be great. I move acceptance of the capables of the school board for 96-97 as read by the chair. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. The next item is a uh, recommend, no, recommendation for um, a freshman boys soccer coach, level two, David Eklund. Eklund. He's in, we just got this today. He's a 91 graduate of Cape Elizabeth High School and a 96 graduate of Princeton. And um, he played four years of soccer, basketball, and baseball at Cape and four years of baseball at Princeton. Um, and he will be pursuing a career in professional baseball this winter. I move uh, we accept David Eklund for the freshman boys soccer coach. I second the. Any other discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the superintendent's request to enter executive session for the purpose of discussion, discussing negotiations. Right. And I, I do not need a negotiation. I do not need an executive session for personnel, so it's just for negotiations. Great. Thing. 
Um, second, all those in favor? 7-0. Before we adjourn, I just want to announce a few meetings. Um, we have the Athletic Study Committee tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at the Community Center. Um, the Policy Subcommittee meeting will be Thursday, August 22nd at 2.30. That is an hour change in time in the Council Chamber Conference Room. Uh, the, opening, the opening day for teachers is Thursday, August 29th. And school will be starting on Tuesday, September 3rd. The bus schedule is out in the Cape Courier, or the most recent Cape Courier, and there have been some changes. Thank you, Sue. And there will be a school celebration um, on Thursday, September 5th at the Pond Cove Middle School Cafetorium, sponsored by all the parents' associations at 5.30. And the finance committee, the next finance committee meeting will be Tuesday, September 10th at 6.30, followed by the school board meeting at 7.30. Town Hall. Thank you. That's it. Oh, Sue. Oh, Sue. Sorry. What would be the format to um, add a coach, a third coach to field hockey, um, funded exclusively by the booster organization? And that was something that was discussed in June, um, um, pending anticipated numbers, and um, the the boosters have um, voted to finance it um, and it was the feeling of the coaches at that time that it was a little premature I mean because kids that sign up don't always come out and um, we have gone with two days practice with 51 kids and two people um, and what I think we're recommending is a second JV team and not a freshman team um, but perhaps some assistance with coaches that so if it isn't funded by the school, what do we do next? We've been through this a I few years ago where the booster, you, you remember, yeah. and that was, you can't do it. I mean, we have to, we have to hire them and be responsible for them. Um, but what the boosters might be able to do is pick up other costs so that money was freed up so that we, we did hire the coach and do all that. I mean, is this something that, that is better discussed tomorrow night, or is it... Um, I was asked to bring it up tonight just because I was going to be here. Well, ultimately, um, this group has to make the decision. Exactly. And, and we I have done nothing with it, right. but... And I think best or, point is well taken. It, perhaps if they wish to underwrite part of the equipment budget or something of that nature to free up some money in the budget, but Anne is correct. Uh, they have to be hired by and under the supervision of the school board. Because this is a sanctioned board school sport, not like a club sport. Exactly right. Now, however, if you had a volunteer, an extra volunteer to help, that's a different situation. But if you want a real bona fide coach who will be alone with the students, then it has to be hired. I suspect that we're not going to find a volunteer okay. <laughs> there to do it. Um, just because of um, the nature of the sport. I mean, it's not a well-known sport by the population at large. I mean, you need to be specially trained in, 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 in field hockey to be able to coach that sport. So that's the dilemma we're faced with. The other dilemma is we cut. Well, yeah, that was my next question was, well, you know, this, I'm still very confused about how these teams work out at the high school when we start creating new teams and when we cut and I, it, Is it I feel real uncomfortable just something? adding a, adding a team. We also, had a, we also had the discussion of budget about the athletic budget and it was the recommendation I believe of the athletic director to fund girls lacrosse versus a freshman um, field hockey team, because that was a proposal, because you anticipate the numbers right. to be high. We certainly were anticipated to be high. I don't remember if it was, you know, which one went which way. Um, is there a girls soccer, freshman soccer? Yes. yes, there is. A girls freshman soccer? Yes, there is. Like a girls, like a boys freshman, I mean. Those are equal. It's Those are equal. There's equity with soccer, but not with field hockey and girls soccer, if you know what I mean. Yeah. 
We do we have a stated policy on cutting in athletics? I didn't think we did. The high school traditionally. It, there's a. It, there's not a no cut policy. <coughs> right, but but the coaches have made the effort to keep as many players involved, and in many cases they they eliminate themselves through lack of participation or play time, and but try to keep as many involved as we as we can. But our numbers of recent between this year and last have really risen as this. Remember, the high school numbers have, have climbed also over 100 into the high school, which has really forced the issue, I think, uh, both last year and, and, and this year. Well, it's also our understanding, and, and maybe I misunderstood, but I don't think so. I think the host organization was led to believe that if the numbers warranted a third coach and the boosters were willing to fund it, that they're never What's led it? to believe that by the board, and if anybody remembers what happened a few years ago when is that the at least you're asking before the, I didn't the person the was hired, right? I didn't say the board led oh, to believe the that. <laughs> <laughs> we were led to believe, and I don't by know. whomever. <laughs> by whomever. Well, since the numbers are up, what would be the procedure for a coach to say? Um, would they you could bring a proposal before the board, and it would be the board's. You know, if it's not budgeted, then we would have we would have to work with the athletic director, and if it's to be approved, of finding some way of supplementing the cost. The athletic director needs to make the request. And any kind of proposal like that, the athletic That's director should come before the board. That is the purpose of the athletic director. By the athletic director. I thought this. So we need but that, by the tenth, right? We would need to have the request before that meeting, if it's going to be before us. And is that too far into the season? And you've got one, one coach of 51 students? Two, two coaches of 51 students. Do kids just show up at the first practice? <laughs> or, I mean, don't they have to express interest at of They did, of and, and we had anticipated in the 50s. Um, however, not every year you significantly less usually show up. Well, this year, second still didn't show up. Um, we well, work them really hard. <laughs> <laughs> they are. And I'd like to speak as for They are. They are working hard. Uh, having sure. having <laughs> seen one of those field hockey <laughs> participants last night come to my house. She wanted to be taken home <laughs> by her boyfriend. Yeah. <sighs> so they are working well, hard. So what you have Keith then? make a proposal to us, and he can talk to Cynthia and go from there. He knows, In what, advance he of the knows what the procedure is, and he knows the boosters <laughs> don't hire coaches. Who? Keith wasn't approached. We have told him what our numbers are. Okay. Yes. And but he I mean said he thought if it tonight. was funded that okay. it wouldn't be an issue. But. A personnel issue. Is, an, is, is a board issue, and it's yeah. not a booster issue. And it's sorting out what is booster participation and what is board policy. Personnel is real clear. Um, I don't think we adjourn. We've just made a motion to go into executive <laughs> session. I think we'll do that. Meetings over. <laughs> 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 something <laughs> <laughs>